All right. Uh, go ahead and show them what we're talking about tonight. What does it say on the screen? What does it say under that? That's an acronym. You guys know that. Together, everyone accomplishes more. That's what team means. Now, we are designed to be team players. There is no solo Israelite. That's not going to happen. Right? So let's go all the way back. How far are we going to go back? Way back. Give me Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The scripture says, and Yahweh Allahayim. Now, if you were watching uh, online and you don't know what I just said, if that sounded like the, the computer glitched or something, I said Yahweh. That is the name of the father in ancient Hebrew. Allahayim is how you say God in ancient Hebrew. If you speak modern Hebrew, you would say Elohim. Okay. And Yahweh Allahayim said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make, now watch this part because everybody thinks this thing is something that is not. It says, I will make him, you say it, and is it a, what, what is he going to make him? He's going to make him a help. And what is the help going to be? Meat for him. Not meat like I'm grubbing on it. So a lot of people be like, it's a help meat. It's not a help meat. It's a help. And the help meat means sufficient. It's a help sufficient for the man because when he created all those animals, Adam looked at all those animals and he's like, I, I can't really make a team with none of these animals. None of these are sufficient. Okay, watch, jump down really quickly to verse 21. So it's, the woman is not a help meet, she's a help meet, which means sufficient for what the man needs. The scripture says, and Yahweh Allahayim caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So he took out one of his ribs and what did he do with the rib? Give me verse 22. The scripture says in the rib, which Yahweh Allah had taken from man, made he a woe man. That's the reason why when she walked by, you'd be like, whoa. <laughs> well, I've been wanting to say that one for a minute. Look, it says, and brought her unto the man. Now, you know what he said when he saw her. He's like, whoa. Okay, give me verse 23. The scripture says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. Was man created to be by himself? He was created to be on a team. Team is so important because, watch, you guys know this, teamwork. Okay, you guys got my backup vocals tonight. I feel really good. If you are in any type of relationship, you are on a team. For those of you who are married, remember that you are on a team and every day you have to be analyzing this. Is this team working together or are we all wor working against each other? It ain't no team if we're working against each other. Neither is it, uh, neither are we doing evangelism or fulfilling the roles in the ministry if we are working against each other, even within the body of Christ. The body can't grow if we're working against each other, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so when Yahweh Shai sent out his disciples, did he just say, you guys go out and do whatever you want to do? He put them together in groups of two. He had a team of 12 disciples, and he broke them into groups of two. Give me Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Mark chapter 6, verse 7, the scripture says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. Wow. So we were designed as a team and we are sent out to do the work in the ministry as a team. Why? What did that team stand for? You guys remember what it said? It said, accomplishes more. Together, everyone accomplishes more. Okay. So watch this. Finish this sentence. Two are better. Why? That's what I'm talking about, A. A. Ron. A. A. Ron. You know, Moses, his, his, Moses said that because Moses had a, a stuttering problem. He's like, uh, 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 Aaron. That's how he got to be A. A. Ron. You guess that? Yeah. That's, okay, watch this. Give me Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 8. They have a good reward for their labor. So it means that two are going to do some what? Labor. When Yahweh Shai sent him out, he didn't say, I'm going to send you out two by two and you guys just go rest and relax. He said, you got to do some work, some ministry work. 
Now, when the woman was created for the man, she was created to help him. What was his job? What was he named? He had already named all the animals to subdue the earth, to, right? To put to have dominion over everything and to till the garden. He had some work to do, and he was probably like, "Ooh, I could use a little lemonade or something after all this work." Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse eight. The scripture says, "There is one alone." And there is not a second. Yeah. He hath neither child nor brother. What does that mean? Because if he had a child, what do you what do you do? Soon as your child is old enough to get the remote, you never have to get the remote again. Ain't that right? Give me something to drink. I'm thirsty. You know how long I've been getting you something to drink. You never have to, but they gotta be old enough to do that, right? It says there is not child, there's neither child nor brother. So he's got nobody to depend on, nobody that can help him. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor? Now, when it says that, he's saying, I don't have anybody to leave all of this stuff to. I have no inheritance. It says, and bereave my soul of good. This also is vanity. Yeah, it is a sore travail. Give me this next verse. This is the one we need. It says, two are better than one. And then it tells you why. Because they have a good reward for their labor. It's about work. We're going to have to do some work. On a team, you have to learn how to work, work through, and work it out. Give me this next verse. It says, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. So, Gary, tell him, when we see a man down, what? Well, you do, when you see a man down, you warn the next man. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Does that make sense? Give me one more verse. Verse 11, it says, Again, if two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Two were required. One more verse, verse 12. It says, and if one prevail against him, what does that mean? You walking down the street and somebody jump out of the bushes and they're like, give me your wallet. They're prevailing against you. Two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The more backup you got, the better it's going to be. The stronger your team is, the more safety. You guys know there's safety in numbers. There is safety in a multitude of counselors is what the scripture says. Okay. So we are called to be on a team. And in order to be on the team, you have to be your brother's keeper. And in order to be your brother's keeper, you have to be playing by the same rules and have the same mind. This is very important. In all of our relationships, it's difficult to have a good and honest relationship where you don't play by the same rules. Give me Philippians chapter 2 and let's start at verse 2. This is Paul and he's writing to the church in Philippi. He says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. What does that mean? That means having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. See, so some of us, we can't get on the team because our mind is not made up. The scripture literally says, can two walk together? They cannot walk together. If me and Gary decide that we're gonna walk to the McDonald's up the block and I take off to the right and he takes off to the left, one of us not gonna get there. Right. So we must first be able to agree in order to do any work together. This agreement puts us of one mind in every relationship that you have, whether it's with a loved one, it's with your child, it's at your job. You have to seek to be in agreement. Who wants to wake up every day and have disagreements? Because you know what comes immediately after disagreement? So we have our agreement and then we have disagreement and disagreements lead to arguments arguments. Why? Because we're constantly disagreeing. Why? Because we're not both in this thing for the, the good of the team, right? Okay. Give me this next verse. Verse three, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. What is vain glory? Vain. What's the vain part? Empty. What's glory? Shine. You know, the root word of the word glory is glow. It's an empty shine. What is that? You want the light to be on you. We can have the light on us if we're a team. It don't got to be on you. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but 
in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. What did, what did, what did Yahweh Shai say? Let the greatest among you be what? A servant to the rest. Okay, so if you think you're really great, if you are in a leadership position, that position is about you being a servant. The greater you are at leading, the better servant you're going to be to the people that follow you. Amen. Give me verse four. This is how it's done. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So am I looking out for number one? I'm looking out for number one and number one and number one. You thought I was going to say number two. No, you're number one. I have to esteem you greater than myself. Number one and number one and number one. I'm looking out for number one and you are number one. Amen. We have to, we have to learn to see and think like that. This is the reason why. Give me verse five. The scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. What was his mind like? He, he was number one, but who did he make number one? Everybody else. That's what made him the greatest. He was a servant to all of us. So here's that question that you need to say on whatever team that you're on, you need to be able to answer this question. Are we working together or working against each other? If we work against each other, neither one of us wins. You guys know that, right? There is no winning when we're a house divided cannot stand. Okay. This is what working together means. It means that we, uh, we use the same rules. Do I get to make up the rules? Do you get to make up the rules? No, the most high has already made up the rules. So we need to make sure we have the same rules. We have the same goals. That means the goal is for us all to accomplish what we set out to do. We have to have the same plan. Um, take a look at how these words work. Let's say you have a vision and then you share it with me and I don't agree with your vision, I create division. That's what happens. We're not looking to have division, so we need to have the same plan, same goals, make sure that we, we agree that this thing has to work this same way. It's not a solution if it creates three more problems. You guys know that? It's not, it's not. Okay, we have to put in the same effort on a team. When you're on a team, if you don't put in the effort, you are still responsible for the results. Some people are like, oh, no, you do it, you do it, you do it. If we fail, you are still responsible because you didn't put in the amount of effort that was needed. We need to have the same energy, positive energy, doing the right thing for the right reason with the right attitude. Let's see. Wait, one more time. Somebody, right thing, right reason, right attitude. That right attitude part will remove the grievousness because some people are doing the right thing. They doing it for the right reason, but they doing it with the wrong attitude. That's when it's called grievous. Uh, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to twist up my face and throw my hands down and walk all crazy. No, I'm being obedient, partially, partially obedient, right? You're doing the right thing. You're doing it for the right reason, but you got the wrong attitude. <laughs> okay, now watch this. We are now forming our teams here at Prophecy Ministries, and this is very important. This is an opportunity for everybody to get involved. All of our teams are based on the five-fold ministry. Give me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. Let me show you the five-fold ministry if you have never seen it before. This is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. It says, he that descended, that means he that came down, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. That he, who's the he? Yahweh Shai, that he might fill all things. Now watch this, give me verse 11. Scripture says, and he gave some, what's it say? Apostles, that's one. And some prophets, and some, and some, and those are the five positions in the church. This is called the fivefold ministry. All five of these positions are absolutely crucial in order for the church to function the way that Yahweh Shai set it up. Okay, now watch this. These are the five positions. Do we walk around calling people apostle or prophet? Well, some people, you guys call me prophet, but some people flip out online. They're like, he thinks he's a prophet. I'm like, my name is prophet. 
I just send that. My, my name is prophet. I never told you I was a prophet. Okay. Some people have a hard time with this first title. They're like, apostle. You're an apostle. You're a prophet. Nobody has a hard time with you being called evangelist, evangelist Gary. But if you say, yo, I'm prophet Waddle, <laughs> they don't like that. I'm prophet Dave. They're like, oh, that sounds suspect. What, what is prophecy? The testimony of Yahweh Shai is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? When I am speaking to people about the son of the most high and what he can do or has done, I am prophesying to them. That prophesying makes me a prophet. Okay. Now, if I say to you, oh, brother, I see you going to have a big house and a garage full of cars and you can have real wheels so big. Ha! Wait, that's prophet lying right there. You, you're not prophesying. You making up stuff, bro. There was no Yahweh Shai in that. You just, you test the lion. That's what we like to call it. Look, okay, watch. Pastors, we see that all the time, and teachers. Give me this next verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. It tells you why he put those five positions. It says, for the perfecting of the saints. Who were the saints? You are the saints. For the work of of the ministry. Wait, who's going to do the work in the ministry? You are. The saints are going to do the work in the ministry. So if you do work, what does that make you? A laborer. And we are co-laborers with Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a very high honor for you to be put into the ministry so that you can labor along with the Messiah. It says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These five positions are designed to make the saints perfect so that the work of the ministry can go forth. What is our ministry called? Don't say prophecy ministries. That's, that's the name of our uh, congregation. But everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh Shai, we all have been put into one ministry and it is the same ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? We got to put this team back together. This team is scattered. All these people are all over the place doing their own thing. Let's get the band back together. That's what it is. That's our ministry. You go out, you find somebody, they're supposed to be on the team, and they've gone astray. You bring them back to the team. Okay, now watch this. Give me the next verse. Verse 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the son of Yah unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Hamashiach. Okay. So this is all part of the description of what is going to happen as we are working in the ministry. What are we going to come into the unity of the faith? That's a team. We're going to be in unity. This, this, you can't have a team without unity. If your team is not all working towards the same goal, you have a type of cord. What's it called? Discord is the opposite of accord. If we're all on one accord, there can be no discord in our team. Everybody with that so far? Okay. So we all need to come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of Yah. We all need to become a perfect man. What is it that makes me perfect? What is it? The law? Okay. That's good. What does the scripture say? The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure. What does it do? Making wise the simple. Okay, so he's creating a perfect man. Uh, your measurement to know how close you're getting, it says the measure of the stature of the fullness of Hamashiach. You need to measure yourself, not against me, not against Aaron. You need to measure yourself against the Messiah. And say, am I following him? Where he goes, do I go there? What he does, do I do that? Show him another slide real quick. Now, let me show you these modern day definitions for these words. Because an apostle is simply a team leader or an administrator. Look at that. I spelt that word. You see that? That's how. Y'all probably wouldn't have noticed if I didn't point it out. But I, administrator is not spelled like that. <laughs> I know because the root of this word Administer is minister. How are you going to administrate without you serving? That's what it means. Okay, now watch this. So an apostle is really just a team leader. 
a prophet is just a prayer warrior. He's somebody who talks to the father and the father talks to them. An evangelist is really just an outreacher or a recruiter. That's all that. See, when we take these biblical names, it sounds all spooky and spectacular. Like you got to do something crazy. But when I tell you that a pastor is really just somebody who encourages people and cares for them. Oh, some of you guys are like, yeah, I could be a pastor. A teacher is somebody who just gives instructions. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it a lot more tangible so that you can see yourself in these positions for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Amen. All right. The team leader is the administrator. They make sure that everything is organized and that it gets done. So we have some personalities like that in here. The prophet is a prayer warrior. He or she needs to talk and get permission from the father every step of the way. We have some people like that in here. The evangelist is that person who's always trying to go out and bring in new people, right? They want to tell everybody. <laughs> What's the pastor? He considers everyone's feelings and addresses their concerns. Everybody doesn't have that ability. Some people are like, that's just not me. Okay. And this last one, the teacher simply instructs and teaches. Now you cannot just step into one of these positions. You have to be bred and designed and cultured for it. Your background and your environment that you've experienced in throughout your whole life is perfectly molded you to fit into one of these situations, one of these positions. Since we formed Prophecy Ministries, I have to tell you, I have been doing all five of these positions and it is exhausting. There's a story in the Bible. So there was one time when Moses used to do all five of these positions and his father-in-law Jethro, he came up to him and he said, what you're doing is not good. <laughs> you are going to wear yourself out. You're not going to be any good to anybody. You need some help. Does that make sense? The only one who ever did all five of these positions successfully was Yahweh Shai himself. He has that ability to do that. I do not. Okay. So now that you guys know that, let me introduce you to some of the people that are going to be on our five-fold ministry team. Um, Adela, can you come forward, please? I need people to know who you are. Stand right here. Gary, can you stand right here? Pastor Greg, you still in here in the building? Pastor Greg, where you at? He's coming. Pastor Greg, step right here. All right. Go ahead and step here in the front so everybody can see you. Hallelujah. I'm going to slide down in here. So Adela is our team leader. She's extremely organized. She's literally like my right-hand man, except she ain't a man. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. So... Yeah. And so here's the crazy thing. Ever since we started this ministry, most people think that Adela is my wife. She is not my wife, but that's how closely we work together and how much she cares about the church. She cares about the church like it's her church. And that's how all of us should care about this church. Amen. So this is our administrator. And then we have brother Gary. And ever since brother Gary has been coming in, he's had a desire and a passion to bring in more people, not just the good, the good, the bad, everybody let Yah sort them out. So Gary is going to be our evangelist. Now this is pastor Greg. And as you know, pastor Greg cares a lot about everybody and everything. I'll be like, I don't care, Greg. And he'd be like, you should care. And I was like, I didn't even know that I should care. So Pastor Greg, of course, is going to fulfill the position of being the pastor. And as you guys already know, I'm here to instruct and I teach and that is my gift. So I will be the teacher. How many people do we have up here? Four. How many positions are on the screen? Which one is missing? Uh, see, this is a very difficult position because I know a lot of you guys filled out the spiritual gifts test. And the spiritual gift test online, if you have not filled it out yet, go to our website, fill it out. It will make it very clear who these people are, but it, it's not very clear who that prayer warrior is. So there is a position still left open in the leadership of our church. But what you need to know about that is the leadership of our church are servants. So you can't be like, yeah, that's me. I'm about to walk up there and push Greg out the way. And that's me. Okay, you, you're going to do that, but it's going to be a whole lot of work for you. So if you think that you have the ability, the capacity to fill this prayer warrior position, the first thing that you should do about it is what? That's what I'm talking about. The second thing that you should do is wait for the most high to answer. 
That's what makes you a prayer warrior. It's not just you talking, it's you waiting for that answer. Amen. Amen. Give a hand to our fivefold ministry. Now, let me explain how you guys can also get involved. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. The scripture says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Adonai, Yahweh Shai, Hamashiach, that ye all speak the same thing. Oh, that's very important. Why is he saying that? Anybody who has more than one child or anybody who has a child knows they're going to go ask dad. Ain't that right, Greg? Go ask dad. And dad said no. And what they're going to do? Now they're going to go ask mom. Now it creates confusion. If you go and you ask dad and he said no, and you go and you ask mom and she says yes, that's undermining the authority. It's manipulation. Ain't that right? Okay, this is part of the reason why we all need to speak the same thing so that we cannot be manipulated. Ah, okay. What is the thing that we're supposed to be speaking? This word, this word. So I'm not going to judge out of my opinion. Oh, I think it's fine for you to, I think it's fine for you to have a nightclub here on Friday nights after we all leave. <laughs> I talked to pastor and he, no, that, no, <laughs> that's not going down. Okay, watch this. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Adonai, Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions. Now, you guys remember what I explained how that is? A division is when you take the vision and you divide it. You try to add what you see in to what the most high is showing us. We're not going to have no divisions. No divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That is crucial to this team working. Amen. All right. Addition to the fivefold ministry, we will have 10 teams in our church. This is, this is important information. You guys, you probably want to get your phones out because you're going to want to take pictures of the screens so that you can find out which one of these 10 teams you belong on. Okay. There are 10 teams. I'm going to run through all 10 of the teams. If you're watching at home, these teams also work in multiple areas. These are the teams that we're designing for uh, moving forward in our ministry, but some of these things, you're going to have to make these same teams in your household in order for your household to work properly. Team number one, Sean. Team number one is the outreach team. A very simple description. They're going to distribute flyers and invites the community to grow with the congregation. That's what the outreach team is going to do. They go out and talk to people. Uh, off the top of your head, yell out a name. Somebody who's perfect for the outreach team. Monty. That dude. Monty, we already know. He's been waiting. He's like, I can't wait for that outreach team. I made my own flyers. Look. <laughs> Monty is no joke. Okay, so now watch this. If you were interested in being on the outreach teams, please speak to our brother Gary, he is going to be the leader on the outreach team. Team number two that we are forming is called the first impressions team. How many chances do you get to make a first impression? Only one. This, this team greets the people. They take care of the church building's appearance and they attend to new visitors. Wouldn't it be great? Because it's kind of weird when you first come in here. Most of you guys, when you walked in to Prophecy Ministries for the first time, what did you think we were? You thought it was a cult. What did you find out that it is? The truth. Okay. It didn't happen in one visit. It happened in multiple visits. So wouldn't it be great if the first time you walked in, somebody said, hey, brother, I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to show you where the bathroom is. If you need something to drink right here, here's the coffee. Boom. Somebody who was taking care of you like you just got escorted into the gates of heaven. That's that first impressions team. Okay. Show them team number three. Team number three is our tech team. They operate the media, the lights, the sound, the online streaming, and all the technology that we use in our church. We have some very technical people, and those technical people need to help us out because right now, you guys will notice, sometimes I have to leave from the podium and run back to the sound booth, and then I run back over here. But there's so many people here who could help. Amen? Okay, show them team number four real quick. This is the team. I don't know why everybody wants to be on this team. The worship team. How come everybody want to be on the worship team? Our whole team. That's true. But the worship team is singers and musicians that create an environment of worship. 
They're supposed to lead you when you walk in and you just got off work and you got here late and you feel like you ought to sit down in the chair. They need to be the people who say to you, your rough day made it so that you need to stand up and raise your hands and let all of that go. The worship team leads people into doing that. Amen. Team number five. Team number five is the care and follow up team. They follow up with our new members and visitors by phone, email, online. They answer questions and encourage them to continue in the faith. Because you might walk in here. And when you walk in here, we love you when you walk in here. We're going to talk to you. We're going to offer you something to drink. You come on the Sabbath. We got extra food for you. We're going to love you, but you're going to go home. And if nobody follows up with these people, they will be discouraged. Because at home, they think that at home, their family members think that we're a call too. <laughs> so we need to encourage these people and follow up with them. Show them team number six, the small groups team. The small groups team will be organizing small groups and activities. For example, like our men's, our men's fellowship. We talked about having a breakfast or something. The women's fellowship. We were planning a day in the park, stuff like that. If you're good with organizing and putting things together, that's a good team for you. Show them team number seven. This is one of the most important teams right here. And right now is where everybody starts thinking, that's not me. <laughs> Children's ministry team. Children. <laughs> this, this team is organizing and teaching our children's ministry. That is absolutely crucial. You guys know before we moved into this building, we didn't even have a place to put the children. Now we have a place to put the children. We need to start working on some curriculums. We need to start teaching them so that they're growing up the way that they should. Ain't that right? Okay. Give me this next team. Team number eight, online ministry team. Let me tell you guys something. I told you earlier that there's more of our church members online than there are in this building. And they're constantly asking questions by YouTube, by Google, by Instagram, by Facebook. They're constant. They're calling me on the phone at like six in the morning. No, I, I kid you not. I, I barely can get back to the emails. We have grown so much that now we need an online ministry team to help manage all of these new people that are coming in. So this team is overseeing our online church through social media, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. We don't even have a TikTok. Barakatha. Facebook and responding to our online members. Now, what type of person is perfect for that team? The type of person that every time you talk to them, they have their phone in their hand. You might as well be doing something good. You, you would be like, Aaron, what you doing with that phone? And he could be like, I'm working for the church. I'm being a servant right now. Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. Show them team number nine. Very important team. Security. Security. <laughs> Security team. Because as we grow, we need to make sure that we are safe. So this team works to secure the building, the members, and create a safe environment. Amen. So uh, Jose is the head of that team. And if you were interested in being on the security team, make sure you speak with Jose. That team is forming right now. Let me show you this last team. Team number 10. It's specific to our church. We need a wilderness refuge team. Why? Because these are the last days and we're not planning to stay here for very long, are we? We need to prepare where we are going. We have a place that we are going to and a lot of work needs to be done in that place. A lot of decisions need to be made. So this team is part of the planning and preparation for our survival in our wilderness refuge location. Does all of that make sense? Okay. It's a lot. And it's a lot of responsibility it's a major calling and responsibility, but we can do it if we work together. Let's get back to these scriptures real quick, and I'm in wrap-up mode. That means it's going to be 10 minutes. Luke chapter 12, verse 42, the scripture says, And Adonai said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? That should, that's us. We should raise our hand. Who then is that, that wise and faithful steward? That's me. I have to do that. That's you. Give me verse 43. The scripture says, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Give me the next verse. It says, of a truth, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. 
Wow, that's huge. You just got a few people that you got to be responsible for, a building, some lights, stuff like that. He's going to make you ruler over everything because he knows he can trust you with a little bit. Give me this next verse. Verse 45, it says, but, and if that servant say in his heart, my Adonai delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. Give me the next verse. It says, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in sunder. What does sunder mean? He's going to cut him in two pieces and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Okay, so what do unbelievers do? They think that the Lord has delayed his coming. So they're just going to eat and drink and beat people and talk about them. And they're not going to work with us. They're going to work against us. That's what unbelievers do. Believers, we believe, so we need to work together. We're a team. Give me the next verse. 47, it says, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That don't sound like, that don't sound good to me at all. <laughs> that don't sound good. I don't even want one stripe. You know what I'm saying? What's this? Give me verse 48. It says, but he that knew not, did he know? Okay, he was, he was ignorant. And did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes for unto whom much for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more does that make sense what that scripture is talking about let me let me make it more practical um I think it was about 30 days ago I had posted. It was probably less than 30 days ago. I was like, oh, this is great. We're about to break 5,000 subscribers. And some of you guys commented, that's great. And, and like we're at over 26,000 subscribers in less than three weeks. You have to see the type of influence that this is because these are real people. These are not robots. So when I upload a video within 24 hours, about 14,000 people are being influenced by what they're seeing on the screen, the scriptures that we're breaking down. We need to make sure that everything is running smoothly because we are being, we're reconciling those people back to the father. We need to make sure that the sound is good. The worship is good. The building is clean. The people are friendly because much has been given to us, so now much is required. Amen. Amen. Some of these people, and this is what's crazy, some of these people, they're so hungry for the truth that they're packing up everything they have in their homes and they're moving here to Arizona. We have another family that's moving in about two weeks. It's crazy, right? We have to make sure that we're loving these people and that we are focused on the ministry and that we are all saying the same thing. You all who come here and those of you that are watching online, you are a big part of the growth of this ministry. I want to personally thank you. I have one last verse for you. Because in order for us to be a real team, there has to be a real unity. We cannot work against each other. We have to work together. Now watch this. Psalms chapter 133, verse 1. The scripture says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. This is the message that I have for you tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah.